The reason we're all here, of course, is to hear from Levi, who's a senior lecturer in quantitative human geography at the University of Bristol, a fellow at the University of Chicago Center for Spatial Data Science, a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, and an editor of Environment and Planning B. Somehow, he still also has enough time to be heavily involved in the open science movement. Um, many of you may know him as a major contributor to PySAL, but there's sort of plenty of other things that he's involved in. Uh, and is currently writing uh, an open book on geographic data science with Serge Ray from UCR and Danny uh, Arribas Bell from up at Liverpool. Um, and the quality and openness of their work, both individually and collectively, is certainly something that I found inspirational and just a wee bit intimidating uh, in my own research and teaching practice. Um, you can see what they've been up to at uh, geographicdata.science. So that's a good place to get a flavor of the breadth of their, of their knowledge. But tonight's talk begins in my mind with a very promising question, uh, who wins space or place? And the even more promising answer, it depends. Uh, so on that, I'm gonna turn over to Levi to talk about on space and place in predictive models. Great, thank you so much. Um, I uh, really look forward to give this talk. It's uh, the first time I've given the talk since the article dropped. So um, the first time everybody will hear the full results. So I'm very excited uh, to, to chat about it. Um, so let me just check to make sure that, uh, can everybody see the slides? Um, sounds good. Seems yeah. good. Yeah. Great, okay, cool. So I'll move from here. So um, this is some work that uh, came together since, uh, God, back when I was a graduate student uh, with Luke Anselm uh, at Arizona State, and then later at the University of Chicago, uh, where we were trying to take a look at some of these um, new flavors of multi-level models that incorporate geographical effects. Uh, and we wanted to try and understand a little bit more about their formal and informal properties. Um, so this talk is gonna be a little bit of a conceptual overview about how multi-level models work why they're used, and how they're kind of in intrinsic tension with existing models in geographical sciences, and what you can expect about the, uh, the impact of mixing those two things together. So um, if I can proceed here, uh, there'll be just these sort of four topics. I'll talk a little bit about this kind of geographical notions of space and place, uh, which some of you may already be aware of. Uh, but just to make sure that we're all starting from the same page, I'll run over a little bit of that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the classical models that uh, we'll be sort of elaborating on. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about how multi-level models think of geography uh, in sort of is place just a group. Um, and then I'll try and answer whether or not it really matters uh, uh, whether or not all this work was done or not. So um, uh, I hope that you all bear with me and uh, we'll move forward. So the first part about this work starts from a fundamental tension in nearly any geographical research. And that tension is the one between space and place. And while there kind of exists uh, some scholarship that attempts to bridge this divide, I do not think you'll ever get me to say that word that I've highlighted. <laughs> Just does not fit, I think, well into anybody's mouths. So um, instead of that, uh, I'd suggest that we use these two concepts to kind of understand a little bit about how statistical models and geography represent geographical processes. So we have kind of what I would call spatial models, um, which focus on the system over which objects of study are related. So these are things like uh, models of networks and models of interaction, uh, sometimes some of the models uh, like climate models and things depend on who you're around and the network in which uh, different climate processes, this site is interacting with this site. Uh, rainfall here is going to affect the runoff at a different location. Those are spatial processes. And palatial processes are, are ones that are kind of constructed or come into being through their sort of endogenous or sui generis distinctiveness. And so this you can think of in, in kind of like the classical notions of regional science or some sort of analytic sociology that focuses on neighborhood, life course development, things like that. Um, and of course, geodemographics, for those of you who are uh, aware of things like workplace classifications and, and demographic classifications of that kind. So 
lots of quantitative geography has either a spatial process or a placial process at its core. And I think many people are aware of this. So questions that occur in sort of place-based queries are sort of how and why do regions emerge? To whom are they relevant? What are their properties? Uh, and do they affect the things we care about? You know, if a neighborhood uh, can sort of be said to affect someone's life outcomes, we need to understand the way in which that place impacts its inhabitants and how strongly it does, right? So that's kind of the classic example of place-based study in quantitative geography. Whereas space-based study is usually interested in examining these interactions, right? So how do the entities I'm interested in interact with one another? By what channels or courses does that happen? Uh, and then what impact does that interaction then have? How does this large system then evolve because of these interactions? So these are two sort of very common conceptual modes for the ways that geographers represent processes, even in quantitative geography. Now, one thing that many people I'm sure are familiar with um, is this concept of spatial dependence. It's that nearby things are more related than distant things. Some people call this the first law of geography. There are you know, earlier statements of it than its sort of famous promulgation in the 1970s, but this is a common sort of central notion. When we say that things depend on space, we're saying that nearby things are more related than distant things. And when we talk about palatial dependence, we're talking about things in the same place being more similar than things in different places. Now, this sounds like it has some sort of fundamental relationship to space, but it actually doesn't. It's focused on this notion of place. And I'll show you how geographical applications of multi-level models kind of get this a little uh, uh, confused in some applications. To do that, I'd like to start with some statistical models. So I'd like to start with actually a couple of statistical models uh, and discuss how place and space both get represented uh, in these processes. So first off, starting off with a very simple map that contains some attributes. And if I'm interested in you know, predicting some outcome that I visualized here, I might fit a standard regression model. And everybody's familiar with this model. Um, when I break it down, it kind of looks like this in terms of the information that's represented uh, in the, the, the matrix form equation. And I've got a vector of outcomes on the left-hand side, a matrix of exogenous observations in the middle, and a collection of error terms on the right. And they're related through this vector of effects beta. Outcomes are functionally united to one another. Right? So one row represents one observation and one place in space. If I shuffle that matrix and fit a standard linear model, I still get the same result. So I can fit this model and I can fit this model and they'll be the same thing even though the second row is no longer site two. The geography, what this is illustrating, the geography can change and the model doesn't see that change to the geography of the outcome. And that's extremely important because multi-level models are also blind to this kind of shuffling. Now a spatial model might look at a process like this where you have some sorts of clustering. You can see states like Utah and Arkansas are kind of intense, they're visualized as yellow. And states like Florida and Mississippi are visualized in cooler tone colors, blues and purples. And in this case, we might try and address some sort of uh, statistical relationship where we introduce spatial fixed effects. And that's the delta u there. So we have the same individual level factors that we saw before, and something seems to not have rendered in my slides. So hold on a second. We have the same individual level factors in the second model, which I would call a spatial fixed effect model the same individual level, county level factors that we saw before, but now we're going to introduce some kind of new group level factor that pertains to each group. 
Here I'm introducing a single effect that controls whether or not states are really intense on this response or really low on this response. This is a common method of dealing with spatial heterogeneity in spatial modeling. And it's generally, you know, that, that matrix is represented just by a matrix of dummy variables. This would lump together all of the effects for Arizona and apply them to all of the counties in Arizona. And then it would lump together all of the counties in Texas and apply that to Texas. This model is called a group fixed effects model. And it's a way to take care of the fact that different areas might have different means. And this kind of model is used all the time in spatial econometrics to try and handle the case when different places have different baselines. So we wanna try and make sure that we're controlling for heterogeneity while we're getting accurate estimates of the relationships that we care about in beta. Okay, so this is generally called a group fixed effects model. Now, the only thing that makes this different from a multi-level model is that a multi-level model then might have an additional state level representation. So here, our state level effect U is given its own regression model with its own intercepts, its own exogenous covariates in Z and its own state level error terms. So the way that I generally explain this is that a group level fixed effects model just says these places are different and we don't really know why, but we're gonna force them to be. A multi-level model would say, okay, places are different and we have some information about why they're different and how we need to represent that. Okay, so multi-level models are a very powerful way to represent what's happening at a lower level and then model the upper level at the same time. And they're used routinely since the 19, I'd argue about early 1990s in geographical study. So the theory behind why they're different usually takes the form of this second equation that we specify. Here, the place-based effects are U and our place theory is all the rest of that expression. That's the grand mean for the entire map this is our sort of group level data and about sort of the, the state level processes. And then this is a group level error term. Now, even if I don't have any extra data and all I'm doing is I'm trying to estimate how different places are, even without this structure, even, even without that exogenous information, multi-level models give you more precise but biased estimates than the equivalent fixed effects model. Generally speaking, this means that you get more effects that are statistically significant. You're able to borrow strength across different areas because you understand that counties are nested in states and states share some information overall. But those estimates may be biased. They'll be smaller than what you'd estimate if you weren't sharing information across states. So multi-level models have what they call a pooling uh, effect. They, they share information between everybody and the groups. The way that these models are related is uh, shown here. So in the fixed effect model, our estimates are just the group level average. If I wanna tell you how a place, you know, the, if I wanna give you a summary for a place or control the, for the heterogeneity of an individual state or local authority, I've just used the, that group's level average. Now, if I have exogenous covariates like X and Z, this doesn't work, but here I'm just doing the simplest possible form. If I were fitting a simple model and I were just using fixed effects, the model would return group level means. But the multi-level model, as I said earlier, is different. Its estimates are going to be shrunk towards zero by this term you see on the left. So the multi-level model, you see the estimate for an individual group, J, is some function of the original spatial fixed effect estimate that you'd get from OLS 
times some factor that they call a shrinkage factor. And that has three components. One of them is a group size. One of them is how noisy the groups are. And one of them is how different the groups are on average. So you can think of that as inside of each state, if my observations are really variable, sigma e is going to be large. If all the states are very, very different, if they have very significantly different means, then sigma u is going to be large. And of course, some groups are going to be bigger than others. Okay? So this factor relates those three things together. And it takes the OLS estimate and shrinks it towards zero. What this means is that small groups are going to shrink more than big groups. So if I have a lot of observations, then nj is big, which makes sigma squared e, that term, get small. The overall shrinkage factor goes to one. If I have a lot of noise inside of my groups, I'm going to shrink more to zero. The way that this is often explained is that multi-level models are conservative about noisy groups. So if my problem has really uncertain group means, I'm gonna give you estimates that are really close to zero. Likewise, if groups are really similar, I'm not going to, uh, to, to, to give extreme estimates between them. So if groups are similar, then my estimates are gonna to tend to shrink to zero as well. So this shrinkage factor is the structural relationship between the classical model and the multi-level model. And it kind of gives you some intuition for how these relate to one another. So going back to the original expression here, all, all we're doing is controlling for state level heterogeneity. And when you throw additional exogenous covariates in here, when you throw X variables and Z variables, whatever, when you actually introduce variables of interest, things get more complicated. But the fundamental structure is that when you control for the heterogeneity, you're gonna get these effects that shrink towards zero. You're gonna be more conservative in your, your correction for the differences between places in a multi-level model. So the reason why these models are generally used is because they give you these more precise effects that are shrunk towards zero. They're a little bit conservative in that they understate the actual estimate, but they're nice because they give you more statistically significant estimates. You get better precision on the estimates you do get, okay? And this has some really interesting interactions with geographic models, as I'll talk about now. So one area that I might want to control for is Texas, because Texas is a little weird. It has a lot of different histories and processes, and we kind of want to know whether or not Texas uh, might be throwing our results from our estimation off. So we could throw in a fixed effect here, or we could be sophisticated spatial analysts and throw in a multi-level model. And our multi-level model sees Texas and says, ah, there's a place, let's make sure that we account for it. Unfortunately, our multi-level model can't tell the difference between this Texas and that Texas. Multi-level models are only about groups. So if I take my map and I shuffle it, and Texas becomes evenly distributed throughout the union, the multi-level model still thinks of Texas as the same thing. The observations that are around and scattered around the map are still considered Texas to it. There's no notion of proximity in the way that that is represented in a multi-level model. So in a multi-level framework, the effects that you estimate and the results that you get are only geographic if you design them to be so. One consequence of this is that the model doesn't actually understand the spatial structure and relationships between observations. All it does understand is group membership. So this Texas, according to your model, 
could be exactly as plausible as this Texas. It has no spatial information, just grouping information. So that's important. We don't really see maps that are completely spatially random. And we really don't see maps where your proximity can be ignored. One of the common methods in spatial econometrics to deal with this is a simultaneous autoregressive model. And skipping a little bit over the detail on how this can go, you can read uh, me and my colleague's book at geographicdata.science if you'd like to read more on the topic. Um, one of the ways that you can account for this is by forcing parts of your model to depend on nearby observations. So here I've kind of got a similar structure as to a multi-level model. I've got a model for my counties or my response variable at the top. And then on the bottom, I'm constructing a weighted average of the surrounding errors to be an autoregressive error term. So these are sometimes called SAR models in the literature. And what they do is make it so that your individual error terms cannot be separated. They are simultaneously autoregressive. They can't be separated from one another. They depend on one another. And the closer you are, the more likely our predictions are going to be wrong in the same direction. So if I miss county A and county B is right next door, I'm gonna miss county B and probably in the same direction as I missed county A. So I'm going to account for the fact that things are near one another with this structure. So the error at an individual site is gonna be the average of the surrounding errors plus an intrinsic component. And this is kind of like an AR model in time series analysis where you can flip between a couple of similar expressions of this, uh, this model. And, but the main point is that this site, any single focal site depends on things that happen around it. You can still have a group level model here. You can still throw these inside of a multi-level model because the place-based effect, U, is still present. The simple way to think about the spatial model, the SAR, is that your surroundings matter, but your group might not. So if you throw in a group effect to this model, it'll have group-based outcomes. But the main point is that it's about your surroundings, your, what is geographically proximate, not necessarily what group you're in. Okay. So those are kind of the two big families of models. And we use this second one because compared to a standard linear model, you get no change in your estimates. You get exactly what you would get under an ordinary least squares estimation. There's no difference in the value of your beta. So if I throw in this sort of spatial correction to the model, I don't see any change in my estimates. However, I now am adequately accounting for uncertainty. That means your estimates may actually become less certain. Okay? So when you put this together, um, when you put this together, spatial multi-level models sorry, SAR models are used because they capture geographic similarity. They correct for artificially precise estimates, meaning that your errors are going to be larger because you, you're accounting for this um, uh, spatial variation. And then uh, your, your estimates are the same in terms of their expectations. However, multi-level models capture this group level similarity. And they actually increase the precision of your estimates. So you get narrower confidence bands. In addition, they actually change the value of the estimate. So they shrink towards zero. If I fit a multi-level model, I'm going to get different effects. If I fit a spatial model, I'm not gonna get different effects. If I fit a multi-level model, I'm gonna get more precise estimates. If I fit a spatial model, I might get less precise estimates because I'm accounting for the uncertainty caused by correlation. 
These are intrinsically opposed behaviors. A multi-level model with a spatial component might have undefined behavior. These two things are in tension with one another. They, they, they don't have a, a closed form outcome. Which one's gonna win out? We don't know. It's gonna depend on the structure of your problem. So the work that I conducted here is showing this trade-off, defining A, that this happens, B, showing the mathematics behind why it happens, and then C, showing the effects of that. So these are two intrinsically opposed behaviors that come from, again, stemming all the way back from two fundamentally distinct conceptualizations of processes in geography. I don't think there's a clearer distinction in any other part of the literature than this specific example. If you think about spatial processes, you get one set of behaviors. If you think placial processes, you get another set of behaviors. And those two behaviors are intrinsically opposed. Okay, so in this paper, I provide a bit of discussion with my colleagues about the effects of this trade-off. What happens because you have to make this trade-off between these two types of models? We've got the spatial and we've got the placial and which one wins? Well, we find that classic multi-level models of the type that many people use currently in geographic research may understate the uncertainty of region level parameter estimates and overstate their magnitude when spatial dependence exists at either level of the model. And I'll go into a little bit of explanation of what that means practically, but that's pretty important. One might say that a model that understates its uncertainty is overconfident. And another might say that if it overstates the magnitude of effects, well, it's exaggerated. Now, um, the, uh, the main point of the paper is that the intuition uh, for simpler models has to be updated for more complex ones. You can't take each of these behaviors in abstract and then assume that one of them holds over the other. You have to understand the joint structure when they're present together. This is really interesting because some people think of dependence in models as nuisance dependence. We're just trying to control for the error term and disregard it completely. It actually shows up in the substantive effects that you try and estimate. You can't assume that correlation in your error structure is gonna go away at either level. You can't control for it. It bleeds into one another. And I'll show you how that happens now. So focusing on this nuisance dependence and the region level variance will show up as substantive dependence. From before, the expression for the expression that relates a classical multi-level model to the ordinary least squares estimate is shown above. And it has those three components where your, your estimate from your OLS is shrunk by uh, depending on the group size, the group level variability estimate, and the response level variability estimate. Okay, so there's this thing called a shrinkage factor, and that's going to change the OLS estimate in a fixed effect model to a multi-level effect. The spatial model is pretty nasty. <laughs> so once you account for the fact that things that are near you affect you, you can't separate out any one group or any one observation. So we have to describe the structure of the map all together. But fortunately, there are some structural similarities here. There are a couple terms due to either the region, state level in the example above, and the response. So here, the region level variance represented by sigma z has the same position in the spatial multi-level model. It does the same thing. If you take the matrix algebra expression and sort of convert it into scalar forms, the expression would become basically the same here. So those components that I'm highlighting, 
are the same components analogous between the two models. Likewise, this response level uh, variance estimate occurs in the same place as well. But we now have to account for the fact that the number of observations in a given group is going to depend on the spatial dependence inside of that group and then also the spillovers between groups. This changes the structure of shrinkage and affects how the estimates are actually constructed. So with a spatial multilevel, you actually get within variation, between group variation, and what I like to call across group variation. So you can think of the little observations on the borders of all the groups. Those are going to interact with one another. And internal to the group, there's also going to be interactions as well. So that's what I'm calling the across variation. And that is a fundamentally different behavior. So in the paper, what we do is we define a family of multi-level models and we say, okay, two levels only, simplest structure you can kind of come up with. So we have counties and we have states and we're modeling the outcomes for uh, fee-for-service Medicare in the US. Um, and we're trying to look at how different combinations of spatial structure in either state level or county level models are going to affect one another. So this means that we have two single level models and four multi-level models. And we have a couple of different ones with spatial dependence and a couple of different ones without spatial dependence at different levels. And I'll show you the results in a, in a very clear way in a second here. The first thing I'd like to show is the spillovers. Like I said before, in a standard multi-level model, the strength of your shrinkage, the way that you're, the difference basically between the multi-level model and the standard OLS estimated model just depends on your group size and the structure of variation within and between groups. So you can see on the left, focusing in on Nevada, that the only information that I need to construct Nevada's estimate is in Nevada. I can see that all the rest of the map is white, Nevada's blue, and I know that all the information that's required for me to shrink the model or shrink that estimate from a standard linear model to a multi-level model comes from Nevada. As soon as I introduce space, I can't separate the parts. There's these spillovers that happen and the most interesting thing is that even when you ignore spatial dependence in the group level, so if I say, I'm just gonna try and model sort of nuisance dependence in counties, I'm trying to account for the fact that counties near one another are similar, but states generally are independent. Even when I do that, I still have strong spillovers between states. I still get extreme amounts of information that's communicated between proximate observations. So I can't isolate any one state and use the tricks that are common in multi-level literature. You just can't do it. The part that I think is most important is this part about the exaggerated results or possibly overconfident results. And I'll show you these results now. These are all of the place-based estimates for the uh, experiments that we ran. And what these are showing is sort of the relative effectiveness of Medicare fee-for-service programs uh, in, in the US after the introduction, I think in the, the late Bush administration. So this is pretty important because it's indicating how effectively these states are adopting this policy, okay? Focusing in on one state, uh, these are kind of like the Bayesian equivalents of um, confidence intervals that are shown for the different kinds of models. And you can see there are six models here. The cool colors ignore geography, ignore space. So they're, they're just working with place dependence. They're just talking about groups, which counties are in which states. 
the warm tone colors have spatial dependence between counties. They also might have spatial dependence between regions. So they might account for the fact that nearby states are similar to one another, while they also account for the fact that nearby counties are, one, are similar to one another. The long bars come from the kind of classic non-multi-level framework where we're just estimating fixed effects. And you can see in every case that those fixed effect models are noisier in the fact that the bars are longer and they're more extreme. The estimates are further away from zero. The short bars come from the Bayesian uh, frameworks uh, where we estimate this multi-level model. And you'll always see that these are shorter than the long ones. <laughs> of course, they're short. And you'll also see that they're kind of pushed towards zero. And that's because they're coming from this multi-level framework, right? If you use the multi-level model, you're going to get more precise estimates, but you're going to get estimates that are smaller. They're closer to zero. And you can see that in this case for Arizona, if I use a fixed effect model, I might have non-significant results. But if I use a multi-level model, I might get significant results. And so you can see why scientists in the past that are, you know, plenty of arguments about p-hacking and scientific ethics aside, use multi-level models to try and get more precise estimates. So I've got two states here that demonstrate the pattern that we're talking about below, where multi-level models might understate the uncertainty and overstate an effect magnitude. Focusing just on North Carolina, you can see that all of the multi-level models improve uncertainty. So all of the bars that are, you know, the two bars to the right of the long bar. Those are the multi-level models. And you can see that in some cases, that improvement in certainty is dramatic. The classic multi-level models estimate is almost a sixth of an interval relative to the classic OLS model. So you, you, you just introduce multi-level structure, you get a smaller point estimate, but it's significant. That's publishable. That's great. In fact, when you account for spatial dependence, you see weaker improvements there. When you allow for the fact that nearby observations are similar to one another, you become less certain about the outcome. So when you think about it in this way, the classic multi-level model is actually overconfident. It's giving too much variation to the group and ignoring that covariation between observations exists, both within a group itself and across group lines. So that's what I mean when I say the classic multi-level model is overconfident. The second example can be seen here. So all of the multi-level model estimates shrink, regardless of if you account for spatial dependence. But the ones that model response level spatial dependence, the ones that account for the fact that nearby counties are similar to one another, and those are the ones in the warm tone colors, well, those ones move more to zero. The multi-level model gives you a point estimate that's further away. It's more extreme. It's closer to the original fixed effect estimate. But once I appropriately account for spatial dependence, the, sh the shrinkage is actually stronger. And this is interesting because the standard structure of spatial models without multi-level structure is to leave the estimates alone. Don't touch them, just correct their uncertainty. So this is an emergent behavior that only happens when you combine a multi-level structure with the fact that nearby things are more similar than distant things. This means that in cases where nearby things are similar, the multi-level model is exaggerated. Its effect estimates are going to be too large. When you put that together, that's a pretty serious problem. You've got estimates that are too large and too certain. That's a great recipe to get a false positive. So I gave this talk one time at a colloquium and uh, uh, a statistician objected to me, overconfident and exaggerated. 
Um, don't you mean that the spatial multi-level model uh, overstates the uncertainty and understates the magnitude? Why do we need to account for the fact that nearby things are more similar than distant things? You're just fuzzing the information you have and you're, you're kind of ruining this perfect multi-level structure that ignores the fact that nearby things are, are related. So it's actually the spatial stuff that's too conservative and that its effects are understated. And I thought for a while, not really a good answer at the time. Um, and it's a pretty challenging question, you know, which one is right? If I account for spatial effects, am I kind of hedging my bets? Am I being too uncertain? Well, if you actually look at the spatial structure that results from these, if I look at how similar nearby states are to one another, if I model the fact that nearby counties are similar and nearby states are similar, I get approximately the same spatial distribution and spatial structure as if I ignore that. So if I get the same distributions and the same behaviors in terms of the geographical distribution of effects, but one of the models is accounting for that structure and one of them isn't, then it's necessary to account for that structure. It's necessary to include it in the model because you don't know in all cases whether or not that's going to be accurately reflected by the multi-level model. And even if it is accidentally the same, accounting for the effect gives it a process. It has a theory behind it. It makes sense. It appropriately assigns variability to the spatial component that is being absorbed by the placial component. So if it's autocorrelated no matter what, you need to account for it. You can't just ignore the fact that it exists because it's going to give you overconfident, exaggerated estimates. You need to use spatial when you do placial research. So overall, I can appreciate that this talk has quite a bit going on in terms of the te technique if you haven't ever heard of uh, multi-level models or spatial models before, but I'd like to just leave you with this one sentence takeaway. That space and place are core to geography. Multi-level models have leveraged place to make estimates better, but they're only accidentally spatial. They only accidentally account for the fact that things are near one another. The model itself doesn't think about it. And because of that, they are overconfident about the place estimate. In order for you to get the correct estimates, you need to account for both place and space. So that's the paper. And you can scan the QR code that's there and been present across a couple of the different slides if you'd like to see. The takeaway message, as I said before, is that it's important to think about the representations you're using because if you just think about place and ignoring space, you're gonna have overconfident, exaggerated results about place. So thanks very much. Um, if anybody has any questions or any uh, uh, further uh, sort of comments, happy to take them now. So if I could just add, well, firstly, Thank you very much, Levi. Really, uh, really, well, at least for me, mathematically challenging talk, but um, uh, much appreciated. And I guess I will, uh, so I've, I've asked people to uh, type their questions into the chat and I will, you know, exercise host privilege and just say, um, you know, is there a Python library to apply all of this and uh, how does it scale? Yeah, um, so a lot of these uh, methods are currently implemented in like commonly available packages. If you use R, you can use BRMS to, to estimate these kinds of models. Um, I wrote my own package when we were writing this paper, um, but since then, uh, multi-level modeling software has gotten very, very good. And uh, it's written by people who are much um, better at software engineering than I am. Uh, or at least than you know, 26 year old me was. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, most of the time it's, it's kind of implemented in these pro probabilistic programming languages. Uh, okay. And it doesn't really matter what you use as long as you're you know, accounting for dependence correctly, I think it, it, it's fine. Uh, 
So, yeah. Uh, so I have first question here from Adam. Uh, so would you recommend that all of us who run these sorts of models in our investigation pretty regularly adopt a framework where we look at all, uh, where we try to incorporate both spatial and placial issues? Um, or is each case in a sense different and requires, I guess, a kind of manual exploration and tuning? Process? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, like all kind of applied modeling challenges, you're always dealing with specification issues and you're always trying to find what's the true model. And I guess my takeaway from this is that using space in these models uh, correctly accounts for structure that's gonna be in the data. If the structure's not there, you can see that immediately. You can tell that you know places are generally heterogeneous, but there's no spatial dependence. You can just run a quick exploratory spatial analysis, find that out and move forward with the place-based model. It's extremely rare that those processes exist. Generally, nearby things are related to distant things. So if you're fitting a multi-level model, you need to think seriously about using these spatial frameworks. Otherwise, you might have a lot of false positives in your conclusions. And that's the big takeaway. The overconfident and exaggerated estimates for classical multi-level models. That's, be real careful. You know, somebody who's been dipping a little bit into multi-level models recently we've been, uh, <laughs> these are very useful uh, sort of uh, take home things. So thank you, Levi, it's amazing, thank you. Yeah, good. I mean, I figure it's pretty much immediately actionable advice for many people that are, uh, you know, doing modeling. Because um, this applies as well for any place where multi-level structures are used in modeling. So um, Hafa uh, has a question in the chat as well, um, which I think is actually pretty important to think about. So uh, Hafa asks, multi-level models need prior information about what groups are, uh, but a spatial model doesn't. If the groups are used incorrectly in multi-level models, it might be less, be, be less precise than in a spatial model. Um, that introduces a couple of really important questions that this work actually doesn't directly deal with. So, uh, and Adam's earlier comment about geographically weighted regression as well. Um, in a multi-level model, you assume you know the groups, that you, you know who is in the same place and you just move forward with that. But a spatial model assumes proper knowledge of the right spatial relationships. So we, we make an assumption that, you know, queen contiguity between counties or the five nearest neighbor observations are the only ones that matter for the spatial dependence structure. So both specifications, again, in this sort of frustrating symmetry of space and place, both specifications make extreme assumptions about the structure of dependence. So I wouldn't necessarily say that this is an issue with groups being wrongly used you can say the same thing about spatial models. If your spatial representation doesn't match the true underlying structure, there may be issues. That's not the correct takeaway from this talk. The point is, anytime you use group-based research, anytime you use a place specification, you also need to account for space. This is not an issue with the fact that states have boundaries how they do. It is an issue that multi-level models don't know about geography. They only know about groups. That's the issue. It's not group misspecification. It's their aspatial models. I hope that that's clear. That's an important distinction and it's a little technical. So it, normally we don't make it, but um, it's in the paper. So uh, obviously j just thinking here, um, you know, in the US context where you have a strong federal system, uh, and Switzerland would be another good example, where you can have pretty significant policy discontinuities at boundaries, um, where in a sense, you, you couldn't redistribute Texas because it's, well, I guess you can't in the US either, but uh, <laughs> there's sort of, there is, a, there is a tension in terms of how you think about, again, whether you need a spatial formulation, even in a spatial, you know, because you would expect if your hypothesis is, is that state policies have significant impacts, then presumably you wouldn't necessarily expect spillovers between two adjacent counties that are in 
different states. Would, would that be correct or is that? Um... <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on the process you're studying, but plenty of examples I'm aware of in the US focus on questions of policy contagion and application spillover. So if I adopt a, a lottery in Georgia, people are going to drive across state lines to enter that lottery. Yeah. So it's, I mean, when thinking about causal inference, you, you can't assume that you have a stable unit treatment, right? So a group is not a stable unit treatment. And that's a whole different paper that is currently in progress. But um, okay. <laughs> basically the, 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 the assumption here is that if you assume that place is the container and you're, you know, that, that is a binary kind of, you're in the place or you're out of the place and the application happens there. Um, you're falling into what Agnew, John Agnew calls the territorial trap. Uh, in critical political geography. So it, th there's a lot of sort of similarities here. We're seeing the kind of quantitative effects of a lot of these issues of fundamental geographical reasoning. Uh, and we're only really becoming able to talk about them because the models are getting so good. Uh, but if you, if you think about sort of place as a binary, yeah, Texas adopts a policy, that doesn't mean it only affects Texas. Those spillovers have to be accounted for. I, I didn't mean that as a kind of <laughs> statement. I meant, would there be kind of situations where you might say, I know that there's there are often spatial effects, but this particular policy where, I, I mean, I'm trying, you know, it might be something about Medicare. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's, you know, I, I've started to see a bit about kind of discontinuity regression and things like that, mm -hmm. where you think that there's a, a big change in the effect at a, you know, at some kind of boundary normally. I think temporal, but clearly yeah. uh, spatial discontinuities as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are plenty. I think Keel has a lot of good papers on geographical regression discontinuity design. And, and that's actually an issue with that kind of effect, right? Is that you do have bleed in the application of policies. And yeah. it's unless you come up with some serious assumptions or the policy indeed has a strict, like no one over the border can get this particular thing, which, you know, you might be talking about that kind of discontinuity between the US and Canada but uh, maybe not necessarily between two different states. Um, so, so yeah, that, that can happen, but um, uh, you, in many cases, you still need to account for, for, for the, what I'm calling this bleed over, the spillover effect, um, possibly at the, the smaller level, even if it doesn't happen at the higher level. And if it happens at the smaller level, it happens anyway, so. Okay. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, there's a question from Ivan here. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent are the errors that come from the ways of implementing the algorithms numerically influential in the different models? Um, ah, it's a good question. Uh, so I, I've written a little bit about how um, in spatial models, you are actually getting less information than you might otherwise when you estimate using a Bayesian technique, sometimes, um, because the uh, effective number of, of draws that you're getting is, is quite small. Uh, and this mirrors some of the things that like Dan Griffith has studied before about um, the effective number of observations that you actually have in spatial processes is smaller than what you actually sort of observe because nearby things don't have independent information. And this is a pretty kind of niche topic and it's very sort of, as you say, numerically influential. Um, but practically speaking, the same model should recover the same effect. And uh, generally speaking, we can trust the results of any significant Bayesian sampler. Um, and I've not seen any significant differences between estimates that come from one software or another. And while I spend a lot of my time trying to develop and improve the state of tools, uh, my hope is that it doesn't matter what you use. <laughs> so when you do find stuff that it does matter, that the differences in numerical implementation are significant, um, uh, I don't know, call me up. <laughs> but generally you hope it doesn't, so. Uh, this question on the number of component groups at a boundary is pretty important. Um, so in the paper, I actually provide an example of Delaware in the US. Um, Delaware is a pretty unique state because it has three counties arranged in a line. So there's only one county that touches the other two counties. All of the spatial dependence in Delaware that exists wholly inside of Delaware occurs between the central county and the two outside counties. And in that case, the spillovers are extreme. The 
stuff that goes across state lines is pretty powerful. So the granularity effect that you're, you're questioning about definitely has a significant impact. I talk about that a lot in the model. And it's also rather interesting from a technical perspective that those spillovers are not symmetric. So the effect that Nevada has on California is not the same as the effect that California has on Nevada. And so there's, there's all kind of tricks that happen here, haven't been studied, and we should frankly be planting a little bit of warning flags on this territory uh, because some of these models are used without understanding that these kinds of things are happening. Um, so, so yeah, it does, it has an effect. The number of neighbors, the size of the group, the internal connectivity of the group, it all can show up. So that's a great question. Can I just interject and ask if this is a chapter in the geographic data science book? <laughs> <laughs> well, a um, <laughs> little, little more material to work with. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, we don't deal with, um, we don't deal with multi-level modeling just because it is such a complex topic. Uh, and like, as you see, like the takeaway message from here is really simple and really sharp, but there are so many different ways that you can take this kind of investigation because multi-level models are so flexible. Uh, so no, it's not in there yet. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and, and I see uh, that there's been a question planted by your co-author here, to, <laughs> to which I'm sure you'll have an excellent answer. Uh, so Danny asked, beyond the ideas in this paper, what are your thoughts on models that help us learn about the structure rather than account for it? Would this always be relegated to EDA uh, before the modeling? I'm thinking of non-parametric ML approaches, perhaps. Yeah, and I think this also relates to Adam's earlier question about geographically weighted regression and the way that, um, you know, uh, Juan Fa's sort of point about assuming group structure. Um, I think that when it comes to doing social science, uh, we are never going to be able to forget about Texas. And models that uh, don't have any prior information about that structure, you know, they will have their uses. I would say that they're probably going to be in exploratory uses. Uh, but when we're asking questions about causal hypotheses, we need to get correct estimates about spatial containers. And, you know, I need to know if this policy worked in this jurisdiction. And I, I tend to believe that um, the, the, the way forward in, in sort of geographical research generally, if you see the progress in human geography paper I, I had with some colleagues at Bristol recently, um, is by making really specific testable hypotheses. Because, you know, it's, there's a causal revolution going on and we're not really playing with that. We need to get more specific about what place does. We can't just say that it's, you know, this magic container that then Texas has an effect. We have to get specific about what's happening and why it's happening. So I actually do think that we need to move away from the, the models that sort of learn about structure when it comes to trying to do causal inference. There's been a great collection of exploratory work that's gone on in geography, I'd argue, since the late 18 or 1980s. But um, I think where we've kind of failed ever since the 1955 article in the annals about you know, causation in geography, we've really failed at doing that. And I think these better um, sort of theoretically informed model structures will help us get there. So I don't think that the sort of the, the models that learn about structure are good, but I've seen sort of too many applications where they're under-informed and you kind of get this pareidolic effect where you see something and you come up with a really good explanation, you tweak the uh, specification and you come up with an entirely different pattern. And uh, some of the work that I've done in geographically weighted regression and uh, sort of Bayesian spatially varying coefficient models indicates that there's a lot of reasons why something can spatially vary. And it's not always that it's space causing that to happen. Uh, so I've become a little bit more skeptical about that family of models. And I think the only way really out of that is by trying to learn more about what makes the place important and what makes space important. I don't think that discovering that is going to give us as much useful information about causal processes. And, you know, maybe that's a, a what is it, a volte face, a, a, an about turn in my thinking recently, but um, it's definitely, definitely, I think the way forward. I think uh, there's there's one more question uh, that uh, Renee has clearly taken quite some time to kind of frame, and so I think it would be 
fair to give uh, to give you a chance to answer Renee's. And then what I'm going to do is once you're done, I'll I'll stop the recording, and I you you may have many other things to do. Uh, otherwise, what we generally do at this point is try to have a little bit of a social and a chance for people who didn't feel comfortable asking a question in the chat to kind of stick around. So um, sure, yeah. probably read Renee's question faster than I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. So uh, Renee asks, um, in a spatio-temporal context, what would I recommend for cases in which space suggests the forming of other groups than time? This is this type of combined spatio-temporal heterogeneity could, for instance, occur in cases of complex relocations of processes over time. One example would be hierarchically structured imitation processes between higher and lower order places that may not, may not be close to each other spatially, but of course, geographically. So um, I guess what I would call this is like a place evolution effect where a place becomes important and then stops being important. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really challenging. I mean, uh, this paper is the first paper to look at the formal properties of the combined effects of these two components. Whereas the models have been used for seven years in the wild, ah, nine years, almost 10. So this is the first time that anybody's put together that these two things are trading off in this exact manner. And it has this effect. Once you throw time in, I have no clue. I have no idea what would happen. I have some priors, you know, maybe you have kind of the same trade-off between a temporal multi-level and a temporal autoregressive process. But I, I think these models are too complicated to just throw at data without understanding uh, the sort of formal implications of the structures you're imposing. So um, I'm kind of becoming a little bit more, some might call it stodgy, I guess, but I think it's just theoretically informed. When you estimate a model, you need to know what all the Greek means. So I, I don't, I have no prior on, on, on what would happen there. I have some ideas, but uh, yeah, make sure you understand it because <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Great. Okay. So on that note, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and just to say again, thank you very much, Levi, for, a, you know, definitely a talk that I'm going to need to digest, but that obviously has some really compelling results uh, for all of us. So, so thank you for sharing that. 